to tell you a little bit more about 3D lung models. What do we know? What do we have at the moment to work with? And also maybe some future perspectives where can we go with this? So first I would like to introduce you to the institute where I'm working. It's in Fribourg. It's a French German speaking canton in Switzerland. And this is uh, our very new institute we just moved into in last year. It's a privately funded institute uh, funded by Dr. Adolf Merkley and his vision was to have all disciplines which are related to nanomaterials under one roof. So we have four full professors, one in chemistry, one in physics, one biophysics and I'm sharing my chair in bio nanomaterials in a job sharing model with a colleague, Professor Alke Fink. So we currently host about 100 people and all are dedicated on nano research, which is really great uh, to, to exchange also infrastructure and of course knowledge. So as we already have heard, inhalation of nanoparticles is an issue we need to take care and with every breath we can inhale millions of particles. I will focus today only on <laughs> nanoparticles, nanomaterials, we already heard the definition. So humans can be exposed to nanoparticles by very different sources. We have, of course, the, the, in the nanoparticles deriving from incomplete combustion processes environmental nanoparticles, pollen fragments, various bacteria parts. Of course, workers that engineer nanomaterials can be exposed uh, at an you know, occupational setting. We can inhale aerosols, which can contain engineered nanomaterials, but of course, there is also a great potential to use uh, engineered nanomaterials for biomedical applications, which we can apply via the inhalation route. So to now study the hazards or the risk of these nanomaterials, which can be released into environment, we can assess this by epidemiological studies, studying different people measure adverse effects. We can of, do, of course do animal experiments and when I joined uh, 16 years ago the lab of my former mentor Professor Peter Gehr, he asked me to look into possibilities to do better in vitro assays. So let's take this example, a worker uh, exposed at a working place to engineer nanomaterials. How can we very realistically mimic the exposure. So first, we need, of course, a good 3D lung model. We need also to expose these lung cells to an aerosol, so we should try to avoid the conventional suspension cultures. And then, of course, we need relevant cell response endpoints like oxidative stress, stress inflammation, genotoxicity, and all these different uh, essays to have a good prediction of nanomaterial toxicity in the lung. So to, to design a good 3D lung model, we need to know a little bit more. And now I'm also repeating what Wiki already said. We need to know how and where these particles are deposited when we inhale them. So bigger particles, 10, 30 nanometers, they are deposited in the upper airways, nasal region, uh, trachea, and the smaller the particles are, the deeper they can penetrate into the lung. So this uh, image shows you a human lung cast model of the conducting airways. This is a human lung, trachea, then you have the subdivision into the two main bronchi, and you always have this uh, dichotome division of these airways and it, it ends up here in the lung parenchyma in the gas exchange region and if we then here we need to look a little bit more at the mi microscopic structures this is a scanning electron micrograph of the lung parenchyma and you see that most of the space is filled with air and these air compartments are separated by the so-called interalveolar septa. And if we focus again a little bit more, 
here in one of these regions. This is a transmission electron micrograph showing again the air compartment. Here you have the capillaries with the red blood cells and you see that this barrier, air blood tissue barrier, is extremely thin. You have very thin cytoplasmic processes of epithelial type 1 cells, the endothelial cells, a very thin basal lamina. And of course, this thin barrier is required to allow you a sufficient gas exchange. This is a schematic drawing of the different, of these different uh, parts of the uh, airway and alveolar wall showing again here the ciliated epithelial cells in the trachea. Here you have a very thick structure which is required to also keep the airways open that you can inhale enough air. And then the deeper you go into the lung, the thinner you have to be and here you end up in about uh, 100 to 500 nanometers of thickness. So this already tells you that it's not so simple to just design one cell model if you aim to look at the lung structure, but depending on the question and also depending on what you have or what the resources are, you need different cell models. So let me first focus on the upper airways because nanoparticles also can be deposited in the nasal region. This has been shown by Günther Oberdörster and others. And Actually, it's, let's say, very easy to receive these nasal cultures. You can do uh, nasal brushing uh, with volunteers, which are usually PhD students, and uh, they don't like it. I also don't like it so much. But uh, if you brush these cells, place them into a cell culture dish, differentiate, differentiate them for several weeks, um, and expose them to air, they differentiate into ciliated cells. You also have uh, goblet cells here producing mucus. And in green, you see these uh, tubulin structures, the cilia in red. This is an actin stain and blue. These are the nuclei. The cells of the, the cilia are also beating. I hope you can see it. So this is a slow motion movie file. You see here the cilia, they are functional. It's about 10 times slower than in real time. So they move and in, in the human, they would remove all the particles which are tracked here into the, the upper throat region and then you swallow the particles. These cultures we have now used to assess the risk or hazard of carbon nanotubes, of multiple carbon nanotubes. We already heard they are produced in megatons and because they are very stiff, they are very light and have fantastic properties. So they are used for many different products like for bicycle frames, for uh, technical applications. And now the next question was then how can we apply these carbon nanotubes to simulate the exposure at the, at the workplace when these particles are released into the air. And for this, we have used an air liquid exposure system, which has been developed at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. So the system is composed of a complete, of a sterile chamber here. We place the cell cultures at the bottom side of this glove box and the nanomaterial suspension is aerosolized with e-flow. Such e-flows are already used to apply medicaments to asthma patients. So it's a pharmaceutical device which we have just inserted here on the side of this glove box. So with this system we can aerosolize a well-defined nanomaterial suspension and then the nice advantage is also that we can place or we have a quartz microbalance in the system which measures the deposited mass. So we can use different concentrations of materials resulting in different mass deposition and we can also measure the mass with this quartz balance. And then usually if you present these results, the first question yes uh, is, but how relevant is it? 
for occupational exposure. So we went into the literature and we have looked at data which have modeled the exposure at the working place of a worker uh, to carbon nanotubes in industry. And there are several works, I just uh, summarize here uh, one uh, published by Gangwal et al. And they have measured the release of carbon nanotubes and then modeled the inhalation fraction. And they came up with a full working lifetime exposure leading to about 12 to 46 microgram per uh, square centimeters alveolar retention. So of course, we try to mimic this mass on our cell culture experiments. And if we now use the highest suspension concentration we can design, we need to do a five weeks repeated exposure, five days per week, because the students also would like to have weekends. Uh, so we came up with 10 microgram per square centimeters, mimicking more or less this full time um, lifetime exposure to carbon nanotubes. So let's now go a little bit deeper into the lung. I have mentioned this very thin air blood tissue barrier. Here we do not have cilias because this would be too thick and then oxygen diffusion would be more problematic in comparison to non-ciliated cells. So here uh, we have another immune system we have another system which is much more important to clear nanoparticles which can reach the deep lung, and these are the immune cells. We already heard about macrophages. These are professional phagocytotic cells, usually located on top of the epithelial cells towards the luminal side. And within the lung, the, the epithelial tissue, we also have another species, the dendritic cells, which are professional antigen presenting cells, key cells, for instance, in the development of uh, allergic asthma. And if they are activated, they migrate via the lymph vessels to the lymph nodes and induce there an immune reaction. So macrophages and dendritic cells are important. And this is why we then started to design these triple cell co-cultures, which is composed of epithelial cells. Here you can use primary cells or different cell lines from the bronchial region, but also from the alveolar region. And these epithelial cells are supplemented with primary cells, which we uh, isolate from human buffy coats, monocytes, and differentiate them into macrophages, which are added on top, and dendritic cells, which are added at the bottom side of the membrane. So we have recently uh, bought a 3D printer in, in the institute to inspire the students. And yesterday, before I left, one of my students came and said, oh, I printed you your 3D model. So I'm very proud now. So you are the first, the first audience which can have a closer look. So you see in white the membrane, which is the Of course, the model has been characterized, characterized. We have measured or counted the cell ratio, the, the tightness, and you see here a laser scanning electron micrograph of this culture showing in red the macrophages. And if you turn it upside down, you see beneath the epithelial cells here in white, the, in light blue, the dendritic cells. So this model is now, um, has now been used for a lot of acute toxicity studies because inflammation is uh, usually early, af just after exposure to nanoparticles. And I will show you one example where we have exposed the cells to complete combustion 
uh, generate the exhaust. So we have a collaboration with the University of Applied Science in Biel. They have an approved uh, exhaust emission control station and we have the car and at the end of the pipe we have our cell cultures and we directly expose the cell to the exhaust. This is shown here now in this movie. We have the car running on a dynamometer, different speeds. Here you see a lot of measurement stations because part of the exhaust can be used to characterize the composition of the exhaust and in this blue chamber here which has perfect or optimal conditions for the cell cultures in these two chambers, big chambers here, we have our cell cultures. This is the tube where the exhaust is entering and you also see on the side uh, a system which is important for the humidification of the chamber because you need about 80 to 90 percent humidity to keep the cells happy. So this is uh, again a picture, the car with the pipe and then here the measurement uh, devices. So you need really also an engineer and a biologist that do in parallel the experiments. And the advantage of the system is that we have two parallel exposure chambers. So on one side we can expose the cells to ex the exhaust but on the other side, we expose them to filtered air, so this is our reference cult uh, culture, so no um, particles and no volatile compounds. The exhaust is entering here on top and sucked away at the bottom side, and this allows you here this uh, uh, um, gas exchange, this uh, gas diffusion or particle diffusion which is also uh, mimicking the gas uh, uh, flow in, in the alveoli. This has been shown by some physical uh, characterization of the chamber. I show you uh, one example. So we have used a car, a diesel car, diesel engine with and without diesel particle filter first, these are, are the results for the volatile compounds, carbon monoxide, NOx, um, uh, different uh, uh, components which we measured. And what we also expected is that we do not see a difference for the car with and without particle filter. And then we also measured the particle size distribution and this is in red you see the particle numbers of course for the diesel car with no particle filters so you have uh, really a lot of nanoparticles you see them also here they posited on a TEM grid they form these agglomerates and the green line represents the particle numbers of um, when we have a diesel particle filter and the numbers it's a logarithmic scale so the numbers uh, are really reduced more than 95 percent so these are in red all the cars with no filter you see a high particle number but you also need to consider of course the volatile compounds so carbon monoxide and NOx which uh, was also discussed a lot uh, in, in the past and these components are also very high and you see that also if the volatile compounds are high but the particle number is low, you also have a lot of toxic uh, effects, acute effects. So with this co-culture model, we can study the different constituents of exhaust emission with our system, which allows us to differentiate between volatile compounds and particles. And one really key message which we also had to learn is that it's not sufficient to reduce only the particles, but also we should try to reduce more, uh, the more the volatile compounds and also, of course, the composition uh, is very important. Just briefly, I would like to show you this slide because we can not only uh, assess acute inflammation or immune reaction, but we also can assess the translocation 
we have heard the translocation about the air blood tissue barrier is very low, 1%, but we can use this co-culture cell system to assess a variety of different nanoparticles just to, to assess the possible biodistribution then afterwards into secondary organs, just to give you also an impression about uh, other research topics which are done with cell culture model, models. To summarize this part, I, I really think in the future we should go for a 3D model, so combining different cell types, it's possible, it's reproducible, it's uh, relatively easy, you have the material available, you have to, the inserts, you have the wells, so you should really try to combine different cell types because also in, in vivo, of course, the cells communicate. You need to assess the structural functional char characteristics of, of your cell model, and this is something which I sometimes miss in most of the studies, that the cell cultures are not really defined. And what is also important is um, maybe here that there is not one optimal model for all questions. This is something we do not have at the moment. So for different questions, we need different models. Also, if we look at effects, hazard uh, assessment in the lung, we need to do air liquid exposures. Again, these models or these systems are available. We have commercially available systems. So really, we need to move from suspension cultures to a liquid exposures. And in the future, or it's already done, but we need to do more is to include more complex models, breathing, because we have the breathing, so the alveoli are stretched. And we need to mimic somehow the blood flow in the lower uh, chamber. This is also possible, but again, needs much more complex systems. That's nice. We have a lot of models, but is it relevant? What can we really do with them? And if that, that's a little bit how I work. So if we have characterized a lot and uh, I'm not really trying to test many new substances, but then I try to go a step further uh, because uh, I'm too bored if I have to do all the essays one, one after the other again. And this is now um, the next step. What is needed is that we have validated alternative models. It's the future, it's a vision, and this is how it has been su suggested by Andre Nell and uh, also Vicky Stone uh, on this publication. So if we develop or if industry or research is developing a new material like here carbon nanotubes, then you have to do the 90-day inhalation study to show that it's non-toxic, then it's approved by the regulatory authorities and then you can put the products on the market. Of course now our idea or the idea which is suggested is to have here instead of animal experiment a good predictive alternative testing model. What do you need for this? You need, of course, researchers which develop or which tells you which system is the most relevant or the, mo the best one. Then you need the regulatory authorities which approve this assay. You need industry which is accepting this test. Of, well, if the regulatory says you have to use it, then they will also do it. And you need, of course, the policy, TV, uh, policy policy that supports you and helps you to, to receive funding and to make it popular also for industry users. And this is what we have discussed last year in Washington. This was a workshop initiated by PETA International Science Consortium together with Wikistone. Uh, to discuss with all these, with members from all these four, uh, in, uh, uh, from these four stakeholders, how can we design such an in vitro alternative testing strategy? We have then, uh, Vicky and I, we have then received money 
and avoid from them to start looking into this and I will show you some results. First, of course, you need to have a material which has been shown in vivo to indu induce a certain effect. So we have decided to use fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis as an example, and the material which has been described in animals is carbon nanotubes, it's a specific form, it's UE7, and it has been, or there is a lot of evidence that if this material is applied to animals by installation or inhalation, that this can induce fibrosis. So here you see this thickening of the uh, extracellular matrix, you have a lot of fibroblasts. So now to assess or to establish such a model, we need to look into the key cells which are responsible to develop the disease. You see here an alveolar schematically drawn. And in fibrosis, you have epithelial cells which are important. Then you have macrophages which engulf the inhaled material and release a specific cytokine tumor uh, growth factor beta and this TGF beta then also uh, stimulates the fibroblasts which also release these cytokines and then fibroblasts are activated, you have proliferation, you ha they, they produce a lot of extracellular matrix which leads to this thickening of the of the connective tissue. So macrophages, epithelial cells, and fibroblasts, these were the three cell types we identified. We are using Mitsui 7, this very long and stiff material which can induce fibrosis in animals. We can aerosolize it. This is a picture from our aerosolization system, uh, what we receive after aerosolization on, on a TEM grid. And we do a three-step approach, of course, we need to characterize all the cells. So we start with the single cell cul cultures. And here I show you fibroblasts. And what is really interesting is that if you expose these fibroblasts to these specific carbon nanotubes, you really need several days until they induce the profibrotic uh, markers, so we could not we could not see an uh, increase in TGF beta release after one day, but we had to wait three days until these fibroblasts are activated up an exposure to carbon nanotubes. So time is very important. We already have first co-cultures, so we use uh, cell lines. We use uh, epithelial cells, we use macrophages, and we also use fibroblasts, which are now replacing the dendritic cells, which are shown on the model I gave around. And in addition, we start to look into primary cells because uh, we also think that uh, primary cells maybe are more relevant and also produce more fibro uh, profibrotic markers expression of an exposure to carbon nanotubes. And for this, we work together with MapTech, a company which has now developed the first commercially available system uh, composed of type alveolar one uh, cells derived from humans. So this is where we are at the moment. This is really the vision we have that once in the future we can replace animal experiments. Maybe we cannot replace, but we can hopefully reduce a lot uh, of these experiments with an uh, intelligent in vitro assay. And in our case, this also means that we need to provide standardized protocols which are reproducible and can also be used by industry partners or other researchers. We need to mimic the organ of interest and also the region. So in this case, we do not like to mimic the upper airways, but the lung parenchyma. And therefore, we need to pick very specific cells. Again, I also believe that we need 3D models because these cells interact together 
and we need to show that we can reproduce the findings which have been shown in vivo, and in this case, it's a profibrotic response induced by Mitsui 7. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all the, the group members from the Bio Nanomaterial Group, especially Christoph, who did the work with the diesel car and gasoline car exposures, then Savina and Hannah who are now working very hard on this profibrotic project, of course, all the foundations which support me. Again, congratulations to Vicky, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Barbara. Do we have any questions for Barbara? Coffee is waiting. I, I I really want a car in my cell culture lab now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't help but feel Volkswagen are really in trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have a question about some of the triple culture models, which are really exciting. Um, do you have mucus? In the in the model system, are the goblet cells in there too? Yes. Um, yeah. And then the second part of that question is: What sort of transepithelial electrical resistance do you get? Do you, is it is it high enough for uh, for looking at small molecule transport as well? So for the primary cultures, yes, we have mucus which is produced, and of course, then also the contact of the nanomaterials with the cell surface is maybe less possible, but we see effects, so there is an interaction. In the primary cultures, we receive uh, uh, transepithelial re electrical resistance values up to 500, 600 ohms square centimeters. For the cell lines, it's different depending on the cell line. A549, which is used a lot, mimicking uh, alveolar type 2 cells, we have about 150, 200 ohm square centimeters, but bronchial cells ha are higher. I have to say that since I work on this topic, I have never seen nanoparticles between cells. And we looked at a lot of different materials and different sizes, shape, cell types. They are always inside cells. So yes, I think that for nanoparticles, the cell barrier characteristic is sufficient. But if we work with cell lines, maybe we need to go for more, for higher resistance if you look for chemicals. It's really a difference. It's very interesting. Um, as you very fairly pointed out uh, in your uh, multi-cell type uh, system uh, based on primary cells, it has to be a susceptible type of cells, which is, yeah, given the, the number of population with COPD is spot on. I just I was just curious, if you tried uh, just a primary cells from aged people, uh, because the susceptibility, I mean, they, they lose the characteristics, the resistance and the defensive. So if you have a couple mature PhD students. I don't know. I also do not receive the data. This is, uh, I re these are commercially available uh, disease cell cultures I receive, and they do not tell me because of, of data protection, age and, and sex, and I don't know, yeah, these, these differences. I know from one study where they ha are looking into this now with animals, so they look at, at young animals, at late an or old animals, but I don't know yet the outcome. Maybe Wiki, you, you know more if there is something published. As far as I know, there is nothing published. I know that there is a gender difference, so for uh, different nanoparticles, female, animals are more susceptible because of different hormones. Uh, this has been shown, but age, I don't know yet. Uh, 
Hi, uh, D- David Kinnison here. Um, very welcome to see those um, uh, experiments where we avoid using um, animals in the future, which is really welcome. That's not my question. Uh, as a former atmospheric chemist, um, I'm interested in your experiments you do with the diesel car and your particulates. Do you have you looked at the particulates themselves? Because it's it's reasonably well known that, for example, polyaromatic hydrocarbons will absorb onto the surface of the particulate material, and do you think these might affect your measurements? Uh, to answer uh, very short, no, we have not looked into this because we didn't have enough enough uh, finances to finance another engineer who is looking into the uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons, but it's known that there is a, a different effect depending on the composition of PAHs. And also what I think is very interesting, because we are using so different cars, we just, uh, these are not, these are uh, cars you can rent. We, we rent cars from, from somewhere uh, for three or four weeks and really depending on the car, so we also use different diesel engines, we use different gasoline cars and as you have seen for each car it's different, which is also interesting. Yes. Thank you. For those studies, do you always use fuel from the same source? Because um, it could be that different companies use different additives in their fuels, which could influence the toxicity. So if we do one study, we buy enough fuel that we can conduct a complete study with the same fuel, yes. Um. Now, Vicky, you made a point in your talk about um, the fact that when you looked at copper oxide, the ultimate decision about risk and safety is around exposure. Do either of you have a view about where the in vitro hazard data will fit into ultimate safety decision making to give us any more assurance that people are safe or not safe in real life? <laughs> Difficult question. <laughs> I mean, I've met uh, Günther Oberdörster two months ago at the Society of Toxicology Conference, and he was also listening to my talk, and afterwards he came to me and said, you, are, you will never be able to do risk assessment. This is the answer he gives. I think, yes, he's right, but I also think that with this uh, very technical complex system, we cannot only do hazard assessment, we are in between. It's not only hazard, but we also mimic the exposure, we mimic the, the exposure mass we are exposed to at, at the workplace or maybe in a biomedical environment. But of course, we do not have the, the blood vessel circulation, we do not have the, the lymph vessels, we do not have all the circulation, we have not the renewal of cells in our cell system, so of course this is something we cannot do at the moment. But step after step. I think this is a very frustrating comment by Gunther, and of course it is spread realistic that you have um, still have to use animal experiments, but I would answer it slightly more optimistic uh, if we have some years to go. And I think what's key there is kinetic modeling, uh, that if we establish the, the human equivalent dose, uh, uh, preferably in humans or, or alternatively in animals, uh, and then you can, I think, have realistic exposures in advanced models. Uh, so it needs to come from, from in silico modeling, and I think having realistic models, uh, as you indicated. And then I hope in, in, in due time, perhaps not too long, hopefully not too long, that we can really try to well, refine or replace these animal studies. Yeah, if, uh, of course I believe in this. If not, I would not be here. <laughs> but I'm very careful with what, with what I say here, because you never know. People come then and say, "You told me that." You can. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I 
I think one thing that's really quite reassuring about the in vitro models is that you can really use them now to refine your in vivo studies. So even if you can't use them to replace your in vivo studies, you can definitely cut down the number of animals that you're using by you know, caref carefully controlling your conditions so that they're reproducible from experiment to experiment and then extrapolating between the in vivo and the in vitro so that you better design your in vivo studies. Um, and that is greatly going to reduce animal numbers in the, in the near future. I mean, all the EU projects, which are now, all these calls, which are now all out, really emphasize that you also state which cell models you can use to replace and or reduce animal experiments. I think it's also a change in, in thinking and accepting what we can do which is still different in the U.S., but I think there they, it's also changing. I think as some of the reviewers retire, it gets easier to get the grants through <laughs> to develop, but that's controversial comment. <laughs> We might be friendly, but we like, we like a bit of controversy, that's fine. Okay, please thank Barbara again.